Hi coders. So the first program we're going to make is a simple hello world program. Again, the goals of this uh, learning input and output strings and variables and kind of working with our integrated development environment uh, IDE for short. The IDE I'm going to be using in this tutorial series is going to be Visual Studio Code. I think it's the same one I talked about in the installing Python video. Uh, if not, you can just go to Google, look up Visual Studio Code and install it. It's one of the easiest ones to use for me for kind of just doing simple coding. Uh, it's a little more advanced than Sublime 3, which you'll hear about as well, but not quite as advanced as PyCharm. Uh, but it does give very useful functions for Python and other web development. All right, so we have Visual Studio Code open and we are in our Learn Python folder. Uh, so the reason we want to do that is so that our projects and workspaces are laid out in a way that's intuitive. Um, like if you have a certain set of models, that'll be in your models folder. If you have different little service classes, you put that in a service folder. And you basically want to structure your project in a way that makes sense and kind of something that is uh, standard across the company. If you onboard a new developer from another team or someone else is looking at your code, they'll be able to look through the folder structure and intuitively understand what's going on. Uh, so that's the reason we want to do that, and it's good to enforce these habits early on. So we created this new Learn Python folder. Uh, we have our readme.md, which in Git terms in MD file is uh, stands for Markdown, and that will be a way to present an overview of our project on the, the Git page. We already have readme.md, and we're going to create a new file. Um, this will be a Python file, and we'll call it hello world.py. So .py is the extension for Python files, and Visual Studio Code will recognize the .py and will automatically format this as a Python file. So what I mean that is if you import something, it will highlight it purple. If you're creating strings, that'll give you a certain other kind of highlighting. And that highlighting will enable you to recognize parts of your Python file easier as you get more accustomed to writing Python files. So you'll recognize your variable names clearly. You'll recognize where a method is. Uh, that'll all make sense as you learn Python more. Uh, but for now, just the important thing to take out of that is a .py file is a Python file. Visual Studio Code recognizes those and does special Python things for that to help the developer be more productive. All right, so now that we have our hello world Python file, um, let's make it do something. Um, typically, you want to start your Python files with a copyright. This isn't specifically legally binding in the sense that you went to a lawyer and you filed a patent or anything like that, but it does give you some protection and ownership over your script to declare that this is a copywritten Python file and it shouldn't be used and copy and pasted by other people lightly. Uh, there's other different kind of licensing models that you can also use. Uh, that's more of an in-depth topic, but recognize that some code you can use in your projects and release the code without needing to pay other people for it. And other code, you need to give people specific credit and potentially pay them to use their code. Um, this is none of that. This is just tutorial stuff. So again, we'll just put it to copyright 2020. Um, you can put your company name in there if you want. And then we'll use the built-in print function just to get some kind of output to the user. Uh, so when you're running this Python file from the console, you're going to want your Python file to actually do something so that you know that it's doing something. Uh, that's normally done through printing, logging. You can have graphical user interfaces. You can create a web server that displays a web page, and then that web page will present stuff and be the user interface. But for this simple tutorial series, which I'm whipping out in a weekend for you guys, uh, we're just going to use consoles because it's easiest. And again, we'll use the built-in print function, and then we will pass in a string, which a string is represented by double quotes or single quotes, and we will print hello world. Seems really easy. This is why I really like Python. Uh, that would actually take several lines to do in Java and even more lines in C++ to import libraries that put strings out into the uh, standard output. But for Python, it's one line and it's amazing. Uh, here we can hit this top right button over here that looks like a green play because it is a green play and it will run the Python file in your terminal. 
Uh, if you don't see that button and if Visual Studio has changed a little bit, uh, you can also right click on your Python file and go to run Python file in terminal. And if that doesn't work, you can just manually load your terminal. Um, you can do a ls to list the contents of your directory. And you can see this hello world Python file in here. Um, you should just be able to do Python here. Um, this will load up your Python interpreter and the Python console to let you do things in here. And you can see the current version that I'm using for this tutorial series is 3.73. And again, this is useful for playing around with like one line files. So you can do things like one plus one and that equals two. Uh, five divided by two equals 2.5, which is a float. We'll talk more about the variable types later on when we get to the guess the number game. Uh, and then to get out of this, we just exit like this. All right, so back to where we were, we want to run this Python file. Uh, I personally like using Python files more than doing small things in the terminal because it's really hard to copy and paste things. So if you need to run something that has like five to 10 lines in the terminal, that gets very difficult. It's best to just originally write that in a Python file and run your code from the Python file. Again, that will make more sense when you actually need to do that. But for now, we just have our one line and we'll run this in the, in the terminal. So we hit our little run button here. Uh, we can see down here in our terminal that we do have hello world displayed to the user. So that's how we get output to the user. So we'll expand this script by moving our hello world string into a variable. Uh, what a variable does is it allows you to um, manipulate things as your program is going on. Uh, so what we'll be doing this is extending this code to also display uh, the person's name, your name, instead of world. So the program will be a little more specific to you, a little more intimate, and it'll make a lot more sense. <laughs> so again, we'll move the string into a variable. We do that just by declaring um, our variable. So we declare a variable just by typing in our variable name and then an equal sign. Uh, Python is smart enough to dynamically type our variables so that we don't have to specifically say this is a string or that this is a number. Uh, we just go ahead and type it and then we assign a value to our variable just by doing this. And then we can remove our hard coded string and we can put in our variables name. We'll go ahead and save this and run this in the terminal. Um, actually, just to show you that it's doing something a little different, uh, hello world from variable. And then we will run this. So now we can see in our terminal down here, hello world from variable. But where this gets a little more interesting is kind of manipulating this as our program runs. So instead of saying hello world, we'll just put hello. And then will allow some input from the user who's running our script. And we'll do that just by saying um, person's name equals input, enter your name. And then we'll put a little string here because the string will also be print in the console so that when the person enters their name into the terminal, uh, it'll be a little more properly spaced, make a little more sense. Uh, we can also do uh, backslash n, which will tell the interpreter to print out a new line for the person to enter their name. And then this isn't going to actually do anything except put that person's name into an allocated memory area for our program. So we'll need to actually go ahead and print that as well. So this will give a feedback mechanism to the person using our script uh, to let them know that we recognize what their name was and we'll show it back to them. So again, we'll just run this. Hello, enter your name. Stefan, Stefan. It's not really that impressive. All it did was echoed my name back out at me, but at least we know that our program recognized what we typed in, uh, has it in an area of the memory for the program, and we are able to present that back to the user. Where this gets a little more interesting is we can actually use our two variables. Uh, we can combine them using something called string concatenation, which will just manipulate the string assignment in memory. 
and we will print out hello and then the person's name that they put in. Uh, we'll do that by using the original variable that we typed and auto completion from the uh, IDE, which is why we like using integrated development environments over just writing code in text because it gives us some ways to recognize and make our job easier while coding. For the printing and the string concatenation here, uh, we just do the original variable, a plus, which will tell the uh, Python program that we're gonna be adding something onto this. Uh, we're gonna put in a space, and then we're gonna put in the person's name. So as soon as we type PER, the autocomplete comes up, and then we can select person's name from right here, and we can just click on it. You can hit tab or you can hit enter. Um, tab and enter have slightly different functionalities, I think. Tab will completely replace things and enter will leave it in and you might end up getting some weird variable names. Uh, but anyways, now we have print our variable plus a empty space character and then the person's name. So if we play this, uh, enter your name, Stefan, and now our program actually says, hello, Stefan. So it's a little more personal. Uh, we can actually get rid of this first print line. We just do that by highlighting, deleting, um, kind of manipulating our code over time. And then let's run this again, just to see that our stuff works. Uh, we need to go down here into the console to make sure our uh, input is being directed into this little focus area of the screen. So now we see, enter your name, hello, Stefan. Now it feels like a little more complete program. Uh, let's extend this even more, um, which is kind of a common theme in programming where you write a little bit of the program and then you consistently add on to it over time as you get in more functionality. Uh, that's known as the software development lifecycle. You can learn that more on our blog. I'll leave the link to that in the description. So now we'll ask for the person's name, enter your age, and we'll also get rid of this first print statement. Um, well, no, we'll not get rid of it. We'll just move it down. So again, kind of moving pieces of our code around as we extend functionality. So even though we all know the age is a number, uh, the Python program is gonna read it in as a string because anything that comes in from the terminal is automatically interpreted as a string, which for the what we're gonna do right now, um, that will make sense to keep it as a string representation. Um, so we'll just print the name, print the person's age, and then we'll also do another print line here. Uh, so we're gonna kind of repeat a little bit of our code, which usually you don't wanna repeat yourself in coding, um, but we'll do your age is, get rid of this so it's a properly uh, quoted string and we'll put in person's age. So you can see that this is highlighted because this is an undefined variable. Um, and if you look back, it's because when we copy and pasted, we used person's name. Uh, we're gonna wanna change that to age. All right, let's go ahead and run this again. Enter your name, enter your age. We'll just go with 99 because you guys don't need to know how old I actually am. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, all right. Hello, Stefan. Your age is 99. So again, cool. Uh, we're just using basic input output, um, using strings, putting them into variables. Uh, we put in age. We read that in as a string, and we displayed that as a string. But as you guys all know, um, using age as a string is, is not specifically what we want to do. Um, let's say we're trying to give back to the user the year they're born. Um, instead of just echoing things, we're gonna have our program actually do a little bit of functionality. If I was to do 99 minus the current year, you know, I might need to get out some pen and paper or I can just subtract 100 and then add one to that. It, it's making my mind do work. Uh, the point of programming is to simplify things. Again, we'll just store the current year into a variable. Um, that will allow us to be able to move some things. Um, actually, we don't need to do that. Uh, we can just do uh, year of birth. So depending on the date, we know the year of birth might be wrong if you have or haven't had your birthday yet. But for the sake of this toy program, we're just gonna go ahead and assume that this is the right year. 
Uh, so I'm making this in 2020. If you're watching this two years from now, obviously it'll be different. If you're watching it 15 years from now, then amazing that this has that much life cycle. And thank you to <laughs> the future youth that ended up finding this. And awesome that Python's still around. Cool. <laughs> so uh, we take the current year and we subtract the person's age from this. And this should give the year of birth. Um, but I know that this is a string and you can't actually subtract a string from a number. So this is likely going to throw an error. Um, an error is something that the program tells us that we're trying to do is wrong. Uh, you can get errors right away. Or if we do something like this and it highlights it because there's no uh, variable name that. Or you can get something called runtime variables, um, which are only recognized while we're running our code. Um, that's what this is going to end up being. So when we run our code, it's going to try to subtract a string from this, and it's going to blow up and get super angry. Uh, enter your name, Stefan, age, 99. All right, so type error. Unsupported operand type int and string. Uh, we don't really like errors because uh, you can see that I took time personally to type in my name and my age, and my program didn't run. So we're wasting users' time, and that's not the goal of programming. Our goal is to give back time to the user by simplifying and enhancing productivity. So the reason this is bad, again, age is being brought in as a string variable, and to actually do this, we need to subtract it. Uh, most people give their age as a whole number, like 98, 99. They don't necessarily say I'm 99.25 uh, because then you'd have a, another partial year, and it doesn't really make much sense. So when you're doing programming, uh, you want to choose numbers and variables that make sense. We're going to make an assumption here that a person's age is always going to be a whole number. Uh, we can even tell that specifically to the user because like kids that are eight years old, I don't know why they're using this program, but they might say I'm 8.5. So what we want to do is enter your age as a whole number. Uh, that's another kind of tricky area that you get to when you're letting the user input stuff. Um, they might not even input in a number. They might kind of type out their age as a string and actually physically type 99 um, and in that case you want to do some kind of validation scrubbing of the input but again for our Tori example we're just going to assume that the person using this is always going to put in a whole number so to be able to actually do this subtraction we need to convert the person's age into an integer uh, python lets us do that by calling the int method on a string and now that we have this code written out, this should actually work. Um, we're going to need to update our string, too, uh, because it'll say your age is 2,000-something, which, again, that doesn't make sense. Uh, not 2,000-something, 19-something. Your year of birth is... Um, and then let's type year of birth. So, again, we're extending and modifying our code over time as we're changing the functionality. And we'll go ahead and play this. Enter your name. Stefan, enter your age as a whole number, 99. Can only concatenate string, not int to string. All right, so this is another interesting error that I wanted to talk about, and I'm glad we ran into this. Uh, here in our line 11, we are printing your year of birth is plus year of birth. So as we just went over, year of birth is the integer. Uh, the print function expects strings when you're doing concatenation. Uh, there's a couple ways you can solve this. The print function also takes arguments, so you can do a comma here. Uh, we'll just go ahead and show this. All right, so you can see your year of birth is 1921. Um, let's say we're not using the print function here. Let's say we're making a string builder, which adds strings and data over time. I'll put string equals your year of birth is. So now that we're not using the print function, we don't have arguments. Um, we'll talk about arguments more in the next tutorial. Uh, is year of birth. And then we're going to change this to be our output string. Uh, the reason this kind of makes more sense is because maybe you are bringing in a bunch of data from the user. 
and you are adding this to the output string over time. And at the end of the program, you can just print the output string once instead of kind of constantly printing things. And that makes your code a little more extensible. All right, so back to what we were talking about. We have the output string, your year of birth is, and then we're gonna to try to do the little comma thing that we just talked about. This should fail. I'm actually surprised it's not giving us any kind of squiggly lines to emphasize that this doesn't work, but we'll just do, Okay, that doesn't actually fail. I'm very surprised by this. Okay, actually, I know, I know what it's doing. Um, Python is automatically turning this into a different kind of data type. Uh, that's why we have the parentheses here. This doesn't really make that much sense if you're a user and you don't understand computer science and variables. Uh, we want to change this to just a solid string. And what we can do is, uh, after Python 3.4, they came out with something called F strings, which is fast formatted strings. So we can just put the F in front of our string to represent that we're going to be using the formatting. And then we'll put that in here. So this will automatically convert our year of birth back into an integer. And then it will print that out into our output string. All right. So Hello, Stefan. Your year of birth is 1921. I'm very old. And when I am actually 99, it'll be even more than this. So super old. <laughs> All right. So thank you for going through this tutorial with me where we covered strings, inputs, outputs, uh, integers, and converting things back and forth between integers and strings so that we can manipulate the data and subtract things and present that back to our user in a meaningful way. And then the next part of this series, we'll be making a guess the number game. So it'll be a little more interactive. We'll import some modules and then we'll actually uh, do some interesting things like looping and checking if values. So definitely stay around for that. Thank you. Have a good day.